Hello. Uh, hey, everybody. That's the webinar. I hope you can see me and you can hear me. Please forgive me for this background. I'm in the hotel right now, getting ready for the conference. I'm in Moscow. Um, so I'll try to I'll try to be focused on the content, but please forgive for the surrounding. Uh, the webinar will be about puzzle-driven development. That's the methodology uh, which we're using for at least five years in our projects and quite successfully. So I'll share with you the idea and I'll show you the practical example of how we can use them in the, in the source code in, in a real project in GitHub. Uh, first, the idea. It, uh, well, I got to this idea really many years ago when I understood that one of the biggest problems in managing programming tasks is the inability to control uh, the task and the programmer to manage, not to control, but to manage the task and to manage the programmer if the size of that task is quite big. So you give that task to somebody, you expect the result to come back, and then the time which this task will take is really long, like a week or two weeks and sometimes a month. And this is what makes the project unmanageable. When we have a number of such big tasks and you, when we outsource them to different programmers, when we give them to different programmers, we just don't really know, uh, we, we don't really know how successful they will be. And in most cases, they will not be very successful. Most of the tasks will be, uh, will take longer than expected. Most of the tasks will, uh, will not be completed in time and uh, in the expected, uh, constraints, time and budget constraints. So it's, it's way better to, con to manage tasks which are smaller in size. So if the task which we give to programmer is like one hour in size or two hours in size, then, and then we have a hundred of such tasks, the project is way more manageable comparing to the project which, is, which contains 10 different tasks and each of them is like 10 days in, in size. So the question is how do, can we break down the project into pieces and, and make sure into small pieces? not just to pieces, but to pieces which are really, really small. That's, in general, a management task. So a manager or some, you know, a leader, some, some person who's in charge of, the, of that operation has to do that. But do we, really have, do we really have that kind of managers in a software project which are capable of doing that, that, that breaking down of uh, bigger scope into smaller pieces? In reality, we don't have that people. We don't have people with that knowledge. We don't know how to do that. It's impossible because the, the best person who knows most about the, the, pro, the, the problem we're working with and uh, the scope of our work is actually the programmer by himself or herself. So this is, this is us, basically. So we are developers and we know how to, uh, how to break down uh, the problem into, uh, into elements, sub-elements. So now the, how, do we, how can we actually uh, delegate this, this job of breaking down problems into smaller problems. And that's the idea coming up. Uh, technically, it works like this. We give all the tasks to programmers and we ask them to deliver the results back as soon as they can. And, and we ask them to cut corners meaning that we, we don't allow them to spend too much time on the task. We actually ask them to close their tasks and to close their, their tickets and to close the, 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 the job they're working on and return back the code to the main repository as soon as possible. Implementing only the pieces and the, 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 the solving the problems which they actually can solve on the highest level of the problem. So let's say, I'll give you an example. Let's say we have a, a task that our web application has to uh, be able to generate a new PDF report with some data. It's quite a big task. You cannot implement it in an hour. You can't do it in half an hour. You need like a week of work or so. You need to design that report. You need to, uh, to make sure it's work. it works. You need to create unit tests, integration tests. It's a lot of work. But we ask our programmers, that's what we do in our projects using puzzle-driven development, we ask them to spend really like one hour on this task, not more. So they, they have one hour and the, the problem is to generate the PDF report. So what the programmer is supposed to do is to make as much as possible 
in this in solving that problem and then leave the pieces which are not solved which are not implemented leave them untouched so cut corners and say i i generate the report but it's empty so here's your pdf report but it doesn't contain any data it's just a a, a white page but you can click the button and you can download it so you have the report right there but it's empty so did i manage as if i'm a programmer did i manage to solve the, the problem yes i did actually i create the report it doesn't have the text it doesn't have the content it's a problem it's a bug but that's a problem for the future programmer for the next step for somebody who will come after me so i am in this case i behave like a manager now so i got one big task and then i return back the code which contains some implementation some high level implementation and then i leave the piece there one of the like part of that implementation i i mark it like for the future i say this piece of code is not implemented yet this class is not ready this feature is not ready that's for the future but i did my part and i return it back to the to the source code to, to remote to the main repository and i spend like half an hour or one hour of, to do that because it's not so difficult i mean it's it also difficult it takes some time i will need to think about the architecture i need to think about the design so i need to do something which will make it possible to implement the feature on the highest level and then I return back my code to repository, make sure it's compilable, make sure it's testable, make sure the build is clean, make sure everything is, is, is actually returnable back to the repository. But it's not complete implementation. So I really actually technically and logically, I cut corners. So I, I try to be as lazy as possible. That's the philosophy. So we ask our programmers to be as lazy as possible and as soon as possible return the results back. Don't hold the task in your hands for too long. Return it back to us with, with, with some implementation. And when you return back the code, you mark certain pieces inside in the text. You put markers there and say, this class is not ready, fix it later. This unit test doesn't work, I just disabled it, fix it later. This functionality is using the, this, is using the plain text, uh, uh, some, you know, uh, a plain text uh, placeholder so it's not the real content I'm not getting the data from the database so get it later make it make make it make it you know implement it later so I return back my code to the master branch with like five or ten or I don't know how many these markers in the source code and we call them puzzles so we call that markers we call them puzzles so each marker is a puzzle and each marker starts with a to do keyword. I'll show you right now the code and, and you will see it's, it's, it's really simple. You just say to do, which means to do in the future. You say to do, and then you put the label of the, of the current issue you're working on. And then you explain what needs to be done. And that's it. And then when your code comes back to the main repository, to the master branch, when it actually passes all the quality control, it has to be buildable, it has to be testable, the bill has to be clean and it has to go through all code reviews so we have to accept your code it can be you can you cannot cut corners and uh, compromise quality so the quality has to be at the same level if the quality before you started working on your piece if the quality was on that level then you have to return your piece and keep the quality on the same level that's important as long as you as long as you can do that we are fine with as little implementation you can provide as is possible. Of course, there are some, you know, of course it's possible to abuse the system and really return like nothing. Like here's your one hour of work and instead of making this PDF report, you just, you just maybe introduce, uh, a, I don't know, a small little label somewhere in, in, the, in the screen and say, hey, I've done my job. So, but that's not, not, well, sometimes it may happen. People do that when they only start using this system. But in reality, like if you work for some time, you get used to it and you realize that it's not going to work because your code will have to go through the code review. So the manual code review, so help, there will be some person, some other developer, an architect, who will actually check your code and, uh, and will reject it. So your pull request will be rejected and you will, you will get the like, response back that it's not so good, you didn't, you didn't implement enough. But it, it doesn't happen with people who work with us for, I don't know, for at least if they complete at least like five, 10 tasks, they realize they, they find out what's the right amount of contribution you provide. 
to make sure that your code actually gets into the master branch. But still, the main philosophy is be lazy. So be as lazy as possible, because what's important is that you don't hold your ticket, you don't hold your job in your hands for too long. The faster you return it back, the better for us, the more manageable is the system. Because if everybody, if all programmers in the project return back their codes faster, like really fast, in really like half an hour, one hour, a few hours, then we can convert, this is the, the final step. We find these puzzles in the source code, we find that uh, markers over there, and then we convert them to new tasks. So if your task was to create the PDF report and you started it, you designed just a button which says download the report, and then I click the button and I get an empty page which doesn't have anything, so you left the puzzle there which is saying, hey, the content is not there, so you find it out somehow in a database and put it there. So we immediately create a new task for your fellow programmer, for another programmer, and say, hey, there's a task for you which, uh, where you have to fetch the content from a database and put it in the report. And maybe this task will come back to you as well. So it doesn't mean that this task will be for somebody else. We, we, we may give that task to you as well. I have a number of projects, well, many projects, and I use this technique in them, even though I'm the only developer there. So I'm just myself there. I don't have any other programmers. So you would imagine I would just be able to sit just by myself working on one long task for a month. But I don't do that because I'm used to this puzzle-driven development which actually makes my work more comfortable. Every time I start on working on something, I implement as little as possible and immediately try to put it back and deploy the production. So I put back something with puzzles inside and then it goes to production, it builds everything, the, the build you know, stays, everything, all the pieces, they, they glue together and then I have uh, more tasks for the future. So actually, this puzzle-driven development plans my work. It builds the agenda for me. Instead of me all the time thinking about how will I finish this long-running task, and it's always like hanging above my, my head, and I'm, I'm kind of becoming frustrated because the task is never complete, I always keep working on that. Instead of that, I'm always trying to be lazy. So I return my results back to the repository as soon as I can. So that's puzzle-driven development. That's how it works. I think I explained it all. Um, so the first step is that you get a task, then you put the puzzles in there, then you merge it back to the, to the repository, and then the machine, which I'll show you right now, the machine automatically generates new tasks for you. And then you start working on that, on that task, and you complete them as well, and you generate new, ta new, 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 new tasks from puzzles. So you can imagine that if you look at the project, which is quite long, then you like quite long in time, then in a few months or maybe in a year, you will have like hundreds of puzzles in so called in such a tree. You can call it a tree. So you will start with one big task and then you will go down into deeper and deeper and, and, and puzzles will generate puzzles. So when the system is more or less complete and you look at it, you will see that there's a huge amount of puzzles solved already. And just a few of them will be left here and there. So when you start developing the system and this, and this approach and this methodology, then you will have many puzzles and most of them are not solved yet. So they will be, they will be, uh, they will, uh, from them, tickets will be created. So you will have like a hundred of tickets and all of them are created from puzzles. Then you fix them and you introduce new puzzles and then you have more tickets and you have more tickets. But then you start closing that tickets by actually implementing something which do not have any puzzles inside. So in the end, finally, you will get to the lowest level where you have the implementation of that particular class or that particular method where you can actually implement it in half an hour or an hour. So you have enough time to do everything and don't cut any corners. But that will happen only on the lowest level of, of, uh, of this tree, of this puzzle tree, whatever you call it. And it, and it will happen. When the project is more or less close to its completion, when the scope is more or less done, then all the low-level puzzles will be, will be closed and closed, and then the whole thing is, is implemented. That's the idea. So I created a system just, just a month ago. Well, we had that system for, for years, but it was like internal system. So now I made it public, and you can use it in your GitHub repository. So let me show you how it works. So first, uh, yeah, first of all, it's easy. You, it's called PDD 
uh, zeropdd.com. So I'll show you the, and I'll share the screen with you. Hold on for a second. Enough of my face now. Uh, let's see. Let's see this screen. Yeah, you have to see my screen now. So here it is. That's the. No, I, I think I shared the wrong screen. Uh, once more. Yeah, this one. So we have this application which is called Zero PDD. Um, it's a chat. It's a bot which works on on github it it it, it, it uh, first of all you need to connect it to your github repository i will i will show you how it's connected to itself so let's say this is github repository so first thing you do is you go to settings and then in collaborators uh in this screen you make sure that that this that this user has access to has has read access to the repository this is important if your project is private if it's public it's not important because this user can post tickets uh, without even having access to the repository so if your repository is private then you need to do that you go to collaborators and then you give access to to that user only if the repository is private in public it's not important then you go to webhooks and you register this webhook in there. So you make sure that this webhook is configured like that. This is the name of the hook. That's the URL. Then you make sure that the content type is JSON. And that's it. Yeah, and then and then you click here. This is by default. So just the push event, this is active update, it's right there. So we need that. This is webhook means that every time you push something to this repository, so you do git push then this url is triggered by github server and our server this zero pdd server pdd comes from puzzle driven development so this server will pull your changes and analyze everything there find that markers find that puzzles and if there is something new the system will will submit an issue to this issue tracking system so you can see that some issues already submitted by this user you see this is the username so they were submitted before. So I'm, I'm the only developer, not the only one, but I think I'm, no, I'm not the only one. There are a few people helping me, but I'm the main developer here. And I'm still using this, and I'm using this PDD to help me automate the development. So let's create a new, uh, let's, let's see, for example, this one. This ticket was created about two months ago or so. Uh, it's created by this, by this machine, this is the, the bot, zero PDD. Uh, it found the puzzle in this file on lines 58, 60. And it says that that, that that marker, which is left there by me, you see it says the puzzle was created by me, uh, has to be resolved. And then it gives the text of this marker. So it got all of this information from the source code. Let's take a look at the code. This is file zero PDD.rb, it's a Ruby project, line 58, 60. Let's go there and see this line 5816. This is the file which this guy is talking about. And I think it is talking about this code, this text. It's not on that lines anymore because you know two months ago it was staying there on that line. Now the, the numbers of lines have changed, but the text is still the same. So I left this text there. I was working on the ticket 41. This is the, the number of the ticket, number 41. So I was working on ticket number 41, and then I realized that maybe it would be a good idea here when, you know, when something happens, it would be a good idea to create gzip, um, uh, this, this, in, this compression to the output since it was rather big, so it would be beneficial. So this is the feature which I was thinking about while working on something else. So I was working on some other problem, and I didn't have... I didn't want, I had time, but I didn't want to spend all my time implementing all my ideas. I, I wanted to cut corners. I wanted to complete what I was working on. That's why I decided not to work on this compression problem. I decided to put the puzzle in the code and say, hey, I'm going to work on this in the future. And then I just pushed it back to the repository. And what did I find? Immediately after I pushed, the robot picked it up and created a ticket for me. 
Now I have this ticket. I, I haven't touched it for two months because I don't have time right now to work on this compression. It's not really important right now, but sooner or later, I will implement it. I will make sure that the compression actually works. I will re remove that marker from the code. I'll remove that puzzle and the robot will close the ticket. Let's see how it works. Uh, let me share the screen to show you to show you the the source code. Uh, yeah, I'll show you the I think that one you need. Yep. Uh, here's the code of this. It's a Ruby. So let's stay. Let's say I'm working right now on ticket. Uh, let's say I'm working right now on what's the ticket? For example, I just picked. I need to pick the number because right now I'm not. Well, actually, I'm working on something. Actually, maybe let's make it really real. So I'm working right now on. Uh, yeah, I guess this one is okay. Uh, let me find the number. Yeah, number 40. Okay, right now, because I was working on it, on it just, just half an hour ago. Okay, so I'm working on number 40, and then I, I realized that to, uh, to uh, here uh, would be great to make sure the exceptions that we swallow here are also emailed to the admin in order not to be lost something like that let's uh, uh i don't know let's do it as soon as possible that's my text and also it's a good practice to say how much time i think that implementation will take. So I'll, I'm saying like 30 minutes. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing my, I'm doing actually the management job. So I'm saying 30 minutes, I'm being like a manager now. And I was working on 40, so that's my puzzle. I save it and now I have to go to, uh, and now I have to push. You don't wanna, like I don't wanna show it, but you, you realize what's gonna, uh, what's happening. So I'm pushing it. Uh, I'm pushing it, and now let's see the screen. Again, uh, again the the GitHub. We'll break in GitHub. So that was the list of issues. And now let me refresh. Boom! That's the new ticket. It just showed up 15 seconds ago. The zero PDD just created a new ticket for us. It says. Uh, there's a puzzle here. You see, it's a link. I can click the link, and I go in here, and that's our link. That's that's our puzzle. So it says that look at this file. This is the unique number of the puzzle just generated by the server, and it says has to be resolved. Would be great to make sure the exceptions that we swallow. Blah blah blah. This is the text which I typed then there, and it says who's the author of the ticket, and it also gives some some text here like you know if you have some questions about that. The PDD is can work on it for example I will I can say hey hey I'll fix it you know I can because since I'm the, the main programmer here I can do it myself but you can assign it to somebody you have the real piece of management material here you have the ticket which uh, which 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 is a good uh, which is good which is a good material for the manager if you have a manager in your team this is what your manager can use because the manager can say hey this is a good ticket for for Johnny, this is a good ticket for uh, for another programmer. This is a good ticket for our expert in Java or in Ruby, whatever. This is the material which you can use for planning, for everything. It was just generated by another programmer. So one programmer who was working on something generated uh, a task for somebody else. You don't need managers for that. You don't need, need meetings for that. You don't need uh, long discussions about, about what we do we need to do next. You just create, uh, you just mark your problems in the code and they become tickets. And now let's take a look before we close it. Let's take a look. There's a nice feature here. So you can put this, 
uh, you can put this uh, nice badge on the GitHub, which, which we, if you click, you will go to this report. Uh, is generated by the server, and it shows how many puzzles you have in total. So we have six puzzles which are alive, which are not closed yet. They still are present in the source code, and there are 21 in total. So it means that 15 of them were already closed. And we can find our puzzle here. This is the one. So this is the puzzle we just created. And this is its name. And if we click here, we'll get back to the issue. So that's the issue we just created. So this report sometimes helps me, helps me. So if I look at it, I can see what's the situation of the entire problem I'm solving. So I see that, well, more or less, if we solve six problems, then most probably the entire project, the entire product is ready. It's not exactly true. You need like some other management instruments and estimate like instruments for estimation, because you can't just say that six problem is gone and everything is clean. But if you really, you know, get, if you really use this approach and all of your problems come like that, then you can say that, yes, if all the puzzles are implemented, then all you have, all you have to do is just bugs. Because bugs are being reported outside of the system, obviously. So bugs, if you look at this list of issues, look at here. So there are some puzzles. This is the puzzle created by Zero PDD. This is the puzzle. This is the puzzle. This is the puzzle. This one is not a puzzle. This is a bug. So this bug was created by the user who was not happy with the system. And then and, and the user, the Carlos, he said, Zero PDD is creating duplicate tickets. Something was wrong. So that's a bug we're working on. This is, you see, number 40. That's what I'm working on right now. And then this is another bug created by myself. It's not actually a bug, it's a feature. So I said, show total repositories count. So I wanted like some extra feature, so I introduced it right, right here. And we have this puzzle, this one, and this one. So we have one, two, three puzzles, and then one, two, three, actually four. So there are like seven puzzles. This reporting is a little bit off. I'm also working on this now. So that's, that's what the bug is about. So I'm, I'm, I'm planning to fix that. But you get the idea, so how it, and this is the front page of the system. Uh, that's like recent commits. So you see there are some other people are using this, some, some other projects. Uh, that's a recent commits which are, which are happening. So these systems are, um, the, 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 the server is analyzing not just my project, not just this one, but some other projects are also trying to use it. It's quite fresh. Uh, and now let's try to close it. So this is the, the, the problem here, the ticket here. So let's go back to the source code and see uh, and see how it will work if I close it. So let's say I start to work on that. On let's say that issue is assigned to me, and I start doing something. Let would be great to do exceptions. Okay, it's a real system, so let's do something. Okay, let's maybe, uh, for example, let's be lazy. So it's saying like, hey, it would be great to make sure exceptions are emailed. Okay, I don't want to implement the email because it will take too much time and I have like, let's say a few minutes. So I remove the puzzle and I say, okay, I've done it. But then here I'm saying, uh, uh, let's do it this way. Email E, because it's in two places, email E. And I introduce the private methods, which is called email. And I don't want to implement it. So what do I do? I say, hey, I'm working on the ticket number. Let me check what's the number of a ticket which it was that's just created. Yeah, it was 46. Okay, so I'm working on 46 now. Uh, uh, let's 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 sorry. Let's implement the mailing of the exception. Uh, somehow we need to encapsulate the mail uh, client and format uh, the exception backtrace to make it look nice. Okay, so what did I do? Did I implement something? Well, yes. I had just a few minutes, so I kind of solved a little bit. So I solved the problem a little bit. It's like similar functionality here and here. So the exception may happen here, it may happen here. And then probably I'll move this stuff in there too, because it's code duplication. So did I solve the problem? 
kind of. I removed the code duplication. I introduced a new method. I didn't implement the method but because I don't have time. I had just one minute just in front of you. So I put the puzzle in there. I said, okay, it's for somebody else or for some other programmer. So what do I do now? I push it. Uh, I push it with some comment, let's say email. Okay, it's in there. So let me show you. Let me share that screen. Now you will see. Uh, one sec. There we go. It's already closed, as you see. So look at it. This is my commit. I just pushed it. Look, this is my change. This is what I've done. I removed that puzzle. I moved it here. I moved it there. Boom. I didn't do pull request, but ideally I have to do the pull request and run it through the full cycle. But I hope that it's, it's the build is still clean. So now it says the puzzle has disappeared from the source code. That's why I closed the issue. Done. My job is done. So now my manager is kind of this guy. So the ticket was created. I got the information of what needs to be done. I've done something. I didn't do everything. I've done something. And as you can imagine, we have a new ticket in there. I hope so. It's here. And it says, let's implement the emailing of the exception. We have another ticket here. So I just closed one, and another one just showed up. So it's a perfect organization of the time of a developer. So you don't work on something for too long, like I just like I explained to you in the beginning. You don't work on something for too long. You always finish as soon as possible, be lazy, and get to the next task. So don't get stuck on one task. Close as soon as possible. So that's that's mostly it. That's what I wanted to show you. And now I'll I'll try to answer your questions. That was it. And we work with this technology for like I'm saying for years, and it's you know, it's, it really helps us to manage stuff. Okay, well, let's start with the question. The first question, how do, you how do you monetarily qualify the value of the pool in code that contains puzzles? Couldn't, couldn't the developer simply uh, delegate too many features to puzzles? That's, that's the question uh, I tried to answer before. So it is possible the developer will abuse the system, and like I just did. So I, I really, like, did a really little small piece of functionality. I just moved a method from top to down and really didn't implement anything well a little bit so that in real systems it may happen with the new developers who, who are really you know either don't understand the system or they just want to cheat too much but in my experience it, it doesn't happen too too, too 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 often because because every time the code will go through the review if the team is working then the code reviewer will say that it's not enough if, if in my case in that case if that kind of change will be will be sent through the code review, then definitely the code reviewer would, would complain and say, hey, did you really spend half an hour on that? Just to move a method from this line to that line? It's not possible, so you, so you didn't spend enough. So try to do a little bit more. So it's not gonna happen. The next question, how do you quantify the programmer work was worth 20, 30 minutes of their time? Again, the same question. Like I, I'm saying, it's, 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 it's subjective. But you will see, it's not so difficult. As long as all the developers are lazy, they will, come, they will return small amounts of changes. And you will always be able to see how much, approximately how much time they spend. Uh, yeah, another question. If we decompose the task to, to many, many puzzles, then how will the customer benefit if everyone cuts the corners? For the customer, it's a huge benefit. Because manageability of this, of this whole project is very high in this case because with small small tasks and big number of tasks we can way easier predict what's going to happen we can estimate better it's not it's kind of out of a scope of this discussion i'll probably talk about that later like in, in in next webinars but in general think like mathematicians think like engineers what's more what's easier to estimate the the work where you have five tasks and each of them take months like a month of work, or you have 100 tasks or 500 tasks where each task is one hour or half an hour. Of course, it's easier to estimate using this, you know, micro, micro increments. You can predict better. You can, uh, you can use your previous data, your historical data better. Everything will be easier. So that was my main 
main goal of when I was creating that system years ago, that we need something which is predictable, which is more man which is more predictable by numbers, not just by guessing, not just by hoping that we will complete in two months, but by actually but by actually using numbers and, and, and formulas. So we can calculate that that developer is completing 15 puzzles and that feature generated that feature was implemented after we managed to fix 100 puzzles and now in this feature which is approximately the same size we have just 30 puzzles so we can predict that about 70 more we're expecting something like that i mean it's an, it becomes numbers game which is easier easier to play the next question uh, it's very, very practical. Nothing about think first, about design. Each programmer wants to get so much as possible result. How to judge the result? Uh, I'll, I'll rephrase the, the, the question. It's a valid question that uh, each programmer is actually thinking about uh, really delivering something and not really too much about the overall design. Because like in this case, I just implemented a little bit. I just moved uh, one code from one place to another. But I didn't look at the overall design. I didn't think about uh, whether it's the right direction, maybe this emailing functionality had to be done in a, in, the, in a different way, somehow differently. I didn't think about that at all. I just implemented something just to close my ticket. And this is right. This is right. I don't need to think about the design. My reviewer, the architect of the project, will think about the design. And if I'm going the wrong direction, my ticket will be rejected. The architect of the project will look at it and say, hey, you just did it the wrong way. We're actually sending emails differently. You have to use this library, for example. And then it will be rejected. But the amount of time I spend, I invested, it's like 15 minutes or half an hour, is really small. It's not going to be a big damage for me to redo it again. Because the task is small, I can always redo it again. I can always implement it from scratch if my direction is wrong. If I would be doing it for, month, for, for, for hours or for days, then the problem would be bigger. That's one thing. And another perspective is that uh, if I go the wrong direction, we are in general encouraged programmers to look at the source code from different angles and always report bugs if they can find them. So let's say I just implemented something and the code goes to the master branch. And then I have another programmers in the project which will see that code and they will report a bug just next to me and say, hey, there's some implementation was introduced just a few minutes ago. I don't like it. Let's refactor it. Let's improve it. Let's fix it. Let's do it better. Let's introduce this library. So there's going to be new tickets and we're going to and we're going to fix that later. I think that's the right approach to move forward in small increments. in small chaotic incre increments, chaotic. We don't need to put discipline inside the increment. The, all increments have to be uh, not random, but they have to have, have to be motivated strictly by the desire to get the result. So it's going to be it's like in it's like in uh, it's like small these insects, like small ants, when they're building something in the forest. If you look at one ant, there's literally almost no logic in the things that real ant is doing. But if you look at all ants together, you will see the logic. You will see how they actually build something. The same should happen here. So there's almost no logic or almost no attention to the design in each particular increment, in each particular puzzle, in each particular ticket. But then they all together, they will go the right direction because there are so many of them, because of the numbers. So I think this is the right way to develop software in general, to move forward in small increments and in big amount of increments. Each of them has to be small, but together they will push us forward. That's what I think. Uh, is there the next question? Is there a requirement specification that is divine, defined for each by each developer? Uh, uh, the requirement specification, yeah, we have requirement documents. We have some, of course, each project has to have a requirement document. But actually, for the developer, this this puzzle, the description of the puzzle, is the requirement, is the requirement documentation. So the puzzle created by another developer has to be detailed enough. We usually write like quite long puzzles. They may take like a, maybe sometimes a few paragraphs of text. And this is where developers give instructions to each other. 
So when you write that puzzle, you define what needs to be done by another developer. So you become like a customer for somebody else. Maybe for yourself, because that puzzle may come back to you. You become from, so you, you are the implementer, but at the same time, you're a customer. And that's what also makes this system quite balanced, because you always think from two different sides. You always think how to design, how to define your task right, and then how you implement another task right. The next question, I think the estimations are made based on the dynamic of the puzzles, creations and resolution. I guess you need to plot some data and extrapolate it. Yeah, that's right. We have the data. We have numbers. We analyze the numbers. We know the amount of, we, we definitely, we do that analysis. I just didn't show it to you because it depends on your management model. It depends on what kind of data you need. But we generate it. We have this big XML document in each project, which, which is now available for you in public. And we analyze it. We analyze, we see, we see the time, how much time it takes to implement an average puzzle for one program or for another. So we do data analysis, definitely. Uh, yeah, and then there's some comment here that people saying that the history of the software development has shown that upfront estimations are a bad idea. That's definitely true. So we don't estimate upfront. We, we, we give fixed budgets for all tasks. That's how extreme we are. Maybe you will not be that extreme, but we are so extreme. So every time we give a ticket to somebody, we're not just saying, hey, cut corners if you like, if you feel like it. We say, hey, this is half an hour for you. So there's 30 minutes for you and you will be paid for only 30 minutes. So it's like we're pushing, pushing programmers. We're not just encouraging them, but we're actually forcing them to cut corners because if they don't cut corners, if they spend more time than half an hour, they're not going to be paid for that time. We're not going to pay for an hour or two hours or three hours. We we'll always pay for half an hour or 30 minutes. So which means that you as a programmer, you will have to cut corners. You will have to return something back in like 20 minutes because otherwise you will just stop, start wasting your time. So we don't do any upfront estimates. How we estimate is we estimate based on these statistics, based on the, uh, on the big numbers we collect from previous projects, we collect from the current project. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, another question: uh, Do we have tickets without puzzles? Yes, like I I've, I showed you before. So we have tickets without puzzles. We have bugs and we have features. So people report bugs when they don't like something. They just and we if we don't like something, the programmers don't like something, they just report bugs, and we fix them. That's one category. And we have features. Somebody come in and say, Hey, how about you implement something else? That's a new feature for you. That's also a different type of ticket. And we have puzzles. The three, tip, three types of, of tickets we're working on. Uh, do you pay for new puzzles? No, we don't pay for puzzles. We pay only for bugs, for new bugs and new features reported. But puzzles are generated automatically. So if you are a programmer, you start working on something and then you, uh, you implement like I did and then you generate and you return back the code with like 10 puzzles inside, just pay you for, for, the, for, the, for the ticket you completed. Uh, to do, yeah, the question is to do is a marker for the bot. That's right. For the to do is the marker which this which this bot will understand. So the zero PDD bot will understand the marker and will fetch it from the source code. That's how it works. Uh, uh, by the way, one of the things that holds me back from publicly say that I use PDD is that you're trying to patent it. Yeah, that's true. We have, I submitted a patent for this methodology uh, in 2009, so it was eight years ago. Uh, I don't have a patent yet. It's still an application pending. So I don't, I'm not planning to put any restrictions on that. I, I'm not planning to sell that methodology and to, to ask for any royalties on the, on the patent. So just, just feel free to use it. And now the project is open source and it's completely free and it's not, and there's no plans and it, it will never be for money or with any restrictions. So you can go ahead, the license says so. If you look at the license of Zero PDD, it's a public software, you can use it to, to whatever you want. And for commercial projects and open source, so it, it's gonna be free for everybody. Okay, and now I'm finishing. I think I have like a few more minutes. I think we're done with the subject. Um, another question, can developer instead of a puzzle get new tickets in his hands? Uh, you mean create a ticket instead of creating a puzzle? 
Well, you can, but in this case, well, yeah, you can. You can start working on some problem, and then you see that something you, you're not going to implement, and then you're going to go to the ticketing system and report it. But in this case, your the stuff which you will implement will not be accepted by the code reviewer. So if I would return my changes, in my example, if I would return these changes with the email method back and uh, without the puzzle, then the code reviewer will say, like, hey, you, you didn't complete it. It doesn't look it doesn't look done because you just moved something, but the, 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 the task which was assigned to you uh, sounded differently. So you were supposed to actually email, to send emails with, the, with, this, with this bug, but you didn't do that. So it's not going to be accepted. So that's why people are actually motivated and interested and, and, uh, and forced to make these puzzles, to create them. Uh, the question is, does it work for any common style? I mean, different languages, different syntax. Yeah, it works for all languages. As long as you have the, uh, the, the at sign and then to do, then the rest is fine. You can look at this uh, for, the, for the syntax, for the puzzle formatting syntax. You can look at the GitHub uh, readme uh, page of the zero PDD repository, and it says what's the right syntax. But it works for all languages. We, we're using it in Java, HTML, Ruby, Python, PHP, everywhere for, for at least for five years. Uh, is there a relation between puzzle position and programmer level? Should a junior start with the very first puzzle, for example? Well, it's a good question. Yeah, we, when we start, then we assign first puzzles to more experienced programmers because they, they have more knowledge and they know better how to break down uh, that bigger problem into smaller pieces. So definitely, if you assign the first one of the first puzzles to the junior programmer, then you may have something which you will generate puzzles which will drive the direction into the wrong drive the development in the wrong direction. You don't do that. So you, you, you want more like kind of more experienced people to deal with the higher level puzzles. That's what you want. Uh, yeah, that's that's how we do it. And then the puzzles go down to the to the lower level and they become easier and easier to manage and easier to easier to close. So that's what I wanted to say. I think that's it. We, we've done we've done it in 50 minutes. Thanks for watching. Uh, try to use it. It's free, like I said. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to submit tickets. I mean, to submit uh, questions and everything. I wrote an article on my blog, published it this morning, about this system. So also check it out. It's called Z it's called PDD in action. Try it out. We use it in all our projects, and we're planning to use it more and more. So it's going to be the system for all our future projects. So that's the methodology which proved to be really stable for at least five years. Okay, thank you guys. I'm done. See you next month, the first Wednesday of the month, 11 in the morning, Pacific time. Bye-bye.